Hello and welcome to the online orientation course for PREA advocates. Our first lesson is about what is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. So we'll start with what is PREA? Why is it important and why are we doing this work? So we've asked you to do advocacy around PREA and that might be something that you know nothing about. So we wanted to start with why is this important? What are prisons even doing? And give you some background about, you know, you're going to hear this word a lot. You're going to hear it associated with sexual assault and with sexual violence in general in prisons. And so what does that entail? Are you hearing about rape every, every time you hear Prison Rape Elimination Act? Uh, and where does this even come from and why do prisons care? So let's look at the legislation. In 2003, well, let's go back. In 2001, there was a study that was published that talked about sexual violence in prisons over the 20 years previous. And some of the information that came out in that article was pretty shocking to Congress especially. And so at that time, both sides, both political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, as much as they get along and agree on every single issue, came together, shockingly, and to the surprise of many people who believe that prison rape is not a something that uh, inmates should be subjected to, they came together and they said, this is ridiculous. In um, the years prior, they knew that there were almost 70,000 cases of sexual violence that had occurred and said, we need to protect offenders from sexual violence. There is an amendment that protects against cruel and unusual punishment, and I think we can all agree that being raised while in custody is cruel and unusual. And so at that time, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed in 2003. It was passed unanimously. It protects offenders from sexual violence and also includes language that says that there are no consensual relationships in prison. I think that's an important point to talk about a little bit more that there's no consent. So if I'm an inmate, I am a ward of the state. I'm living in your facility. There is a perceived power and control that you have over my life, over my conditions of confinement. So let's say that you are an officer who works in a prison. You, based on your badge, have a perceived authority over my life, over my future. You could say that I threatened you and have me go to segregation. You could impact the terms of my confinement based on recommendation to not get good time. And so some of the stuff that I'm going to say today, you might not fully understand. We can offer clarification at a later time. You can reach out to WICSAP or your site supervisor and ask kind of what is good conduct time? Because I think those are worthwhile questions but probably won't be answered in what is PREA. Um, so talking about the consensual relationships, we wanted to say in passing the Prison Rape Elimination Act that if I'm a staff member, if I'm a female staff member and I have a male inmate and I, they say, hey, I want to have sex with you, there's, there's no consent. And so you'll hear that a lot throughout this lesson. It's also supported by the RCWs for custodial sexual misconduct, which are the, the law backers for PREA in this state. So it passed in 2003. In 2007, the Department of Justice then reported 60,500 cases of sexual violence that had occurred in custody in the years prior. The final rule, so the official standards were complete in 2012. And you'll hear some about those standards today. The Prison Rape Elimination Act applies both to prisons and jails, also to community corrections and to work release, basically anywhere where you are in custody. So this also applies to some extent to law enforcement. So if I'm in an in-custody situation and have that perceived power and control. There's no consent, again, while incarcerated. I don't think I can mention that enough because what you will often hear is, well, I wanted to, to engage in this relationship, so it's okay. So that's not okay. That's going to be something that the Department of Corrections is going to push back on. So what does it mean? The push for this legislation um, came from, I talked about it earlier, the 2001 Human Rights Watch paper, which kind of brought to light the alarming rates of sexual violence that were occurring in prison. The aim of the Prison Rape Elimination Act is to deter and prevent sexual violence that occurs in custody 
We implemented national standards that attempt to ensure that offenders have the right uh, to an incarceration free of sexual violence. So we worry about the cycle of prey becoming predator. So often folks come to us and we want to make sure that they leave us better than we found them. So for that reason, we engage in a lot of programming, other things that are really positive, really pro-social while folks are incarcerated. And one of the things that we know is going to probably change somebody's life course is being sex subjected to sexual violence while in custody. So um, this is really important to the work that we're doing. The U.S. Congress estimates that approximately 13% of United States prisons prisoners have been sexually assaulted while in prison. So that ended up being almost a million people over a 20 year period. The Washington State Department of Corrections has a zero tolerance policy about Perea and any sexual behavior to include harassment. So sometimes this is an inappropriate joke that's told in the kitchen and we investigate that or somebody that feels that there was sexual intent involved in a past search, we would investigate that. We really take the zero tolerance policy seriously and investigate all such claims. We also want to acknowledge social bias and stereotypes uh, when working with inmates. So whether we believe in them or not, and I would guess that most advocates don't believe in these biases or stereotypes that involve inmates. But maybe some of them do. Maybe in the back of your mind, there are some biases that you've seen a prison show and you think, well, that's just the way it works. Um, this is one of the few areas in the world where it's been kind of socially acceptable on a really large level to make jokes about rape. I think we've all heard an inappropriate drop the soap joke. Um, and so it makes know that that exists and they know that that bias is out there. And so there's going to be a little bit of pushback in speaking to them about sexual assault in prison because honestly, in a lot of contexts, they don't believe that we actually care. Um, so just acknowledging that there's a social bias towards violence and propensity for violence in men, that men might deserve or want this, that they may have manipulated the staff member into the relationship, some of those biases, and we'll talk about that a little bit in this lesson, but we'll also discuss it throughout the day. So, I wanted to talk to you about the importance of PREA. One, it's just the right thing to do. We know that we want to protect folks. We want to make sure, again, and you'll hear me say it a million times, we want to make sure that people leave us better than we found them. And the cycle of violence that occurs when sexual violence occurs in custody is kind of perpetual. So if I am a new inmate who's subjected to sexual violence when I first come in, I likely will act out that behavior uh, on somebody else who now, now it becomes a cycle. So we don't want to see that. That certainly adds to some of the violence that occurs and just Yes, it's the right thing to do. So in the writing of PREA, the U.S. Congress estimated that a million inmates had been sexually assaulted in the last 20 years. And I don't know about you, but in reading that report, and I encourage all of you to read that Human Rights Watch report at some point if you're going to be doing PREA work, um, that's a shocking, horrifying number that we in custody, this had been occurring at that alarming rate of a million people in 20 years had been subjected to sexual violence. And that could include, um, well, that's, let's call that actual sexual violence. I'm going to not say that that included sexual harassment because they were looking at the actual violence. So acts physical acts that were taking place amongst offenders and amongst staff and offenders. Um, the number was based on that percentage of 13% over a 20 year period. So it's an estimate, but regardless, if they're off by a percentage or two, this is shocking and something that we know we need to work really hard to correct. So it's a labor intensive process. When the standards came out, there are a ton of them. There are 190 standards approximately plus subsections for all the standards. And I will talk to you more specifically about some of the standards so that you kind of understand the scope of what the standards are, how much they affect prison operations. Um, but 
We know that the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards have significantly impacted the amount of sexual violence in prisons. And so we feel really good about doing this work and backing the work and continuing to implement the standards. I talked a second ago about the prey versus predator, and this is a cycle that we have seen time and again in prison that once there has been a, an act of sexual violence perpetrated against somebody, often they will then act out on somebody else. And so we know that very quickly a population can be greatly impacted by one act. And even if that's witnessing, as many of you know, as all of you know, sexual, witnessing sexual violence can, can cause some post-trauma. Um, so we just don't want this. We have, you know, for that reason implemented zero tolerance policies. So, and the reason for that, again, is that it's important that we do no harm to the individuals that we incarcerate. So that our goal as an agency, and I think it's important for you to hear this from us, is our goal as prisons, as jails, is to ensure that folks come in, they do positive programming, they learn new skills, they're going to leave us in a better way than we found them. So whether that's with a new job uh, and a skill set, or if that's dealing with or using positive implementation of nonviolent communication, whatever that is, that I leave with some new life skills and not with the new horror that I play out in my mind. So I want you to consider some things about advocacy in prison, because this is a pretty different world. And so maybe this is the one moment that I'm going to give you permission to think back to the prison shows that you've seen. After that, I want you to scratch that from your mind, because they're pretty inconsistent with the work we do, just like any other job. You're going to find that most hospitals don't operate like Grey's Anatomy, and we certainly don't operate like Orange is the New Black. But for entertainment value, probably a great show to watch. Uh, for accuracy about prison. But for this moment, think back to whatever prison show you've seen, and then think about how confined they are and how many people live in one building. So maybe there's 300 people in a building, and so if you're dealing with, you're doing advocacy in the community, you might tell somebody you should journal, you should process your thoughts in that way, and that's probably a safe thing for them to do, because maybe they have one person come into their house in a week that might find the journal, or they can walk it in their car, or they have some private place. So if I'm living in a building with 300 other women, I don't have that. And there are always people around. And me journaling my thoughts related to a sexual assault could actually out me as a victim and then make me more vulnerable. So we want to think about those things when we're, when we're talking to somebody and implementing strategies for their coping. Um, they often can't find a personal space. And so if you think about after any kind of attack, um, just needing that peace and quiet and some moment to reflect and work on yourself and maybe do self -help, read self-help books or whatever you're doing, um, probably not going to find that in a prison. There's always chaos, and there's order in that chaos, but there's a lot of people around all the time. Um, so things that are seemingly harm harmless often are not. So journaling would be my perfect example of that, or telling somebody to take a quiet moment or express their anger. So that's always a great uh, thing that we would say maybe to somebody. It's okay to express your anger, and if you need to go in your car and yell or scream, that would be a strategy that maybe I would use or you would use that we need to process our emotions, and it's okay to be upset or angry and, and work through that. Well, that's not really true in a prison, right? So, like, it's the one place that you're just not really allowed to be super expressive because if I'm an inmate and I'm standing in the middle of the yard screaming, um, that may result in some actions that I didn't really want to be involved in. So there will be a, maybe a perception by staff that I'm not following a directive or that I'm out of control. So the environment itself often is a trigger following sexual violence. So... Pass searches are a requirement. Strip searches are a requirement. Those are done for the safety and security of staff, and honestly, you, if you're coming into the facility. So we do all of those things to ensure that there's order, but to be pass searched and have your groin pass searched a day after a rape is going to be 
probably not the best experience. So we want to acknowledge that that's going on, talk about the predictability of it. As prisons, we are trying to ensure that there is predictability and reliability in those procedures so that they feel like procedures and not unpredictable. And that's really the best that we can do with that. We're saying this is something that's going to happen. This is what it should look like. We would, especially with female offenders, talk through what a password should feel like and look like so that there is some um, some ability to predict what's going to happen next, which is really important to people, that they're able to know, know this is what it should feel like and look like. There's a lack of control following, well, all of the time. So I don't have, I'm not necessarily my own agent when I'm an inmate. I can't just independently do whatever I want. Really interesting, the other night I went in to do midnight rounds. And as I walk through the facility, and it's a beautiful night, it's 80 degrees out, I'm walking through the facility feeling the air, and there are bunnies, and now I'm painting this picture of a place that isn't most prisons, but truly, there were bunnies out, and I thought, some of these women can't do that for the next 20 years. They're not going to be able to do that. So think about, it's a beautiful night, you want to take a walk, and you can't. That's the amount of control that folks have over their own lives. So, so just... Thinking about when you're telling, when you're helping somebody with strategies to cope following uh, sexual violence, that you're not saying, "Hey, you should take a walk," because that might really um, make somebody feel like they have less control than they actually do. Because some of those things aren't going to be possible. We want to be careful in passing out literature, especially in a men's facility. We want to make sure that we're not identifying people as vulnerable or as victims. There is a culture of respect and hierarchy, and that comes from a very poor social construct of masculinity, which includes a lot of violence. And so if you think about kind of the worst movies of masculinity, that we have like this anger and fast women, fast cars maybe, um, that is the social construct that's pretty predominant in men's facilities. So to pass out literature that says youth, youth, um, experienced a sexual assault uh, would out them and potentially make them, uh, put them in a position that predators would see them or want to hurt them. Um, and also staff, if, if it's a staff-involved attack, we want to make sure that there isn't retaliation. And so that's something that we would monitor from the prison side, but also something that I would ask you to monitor and keep a close eye on. So just thinking about what you're doing in a very deliberate way at all times when dealing with inmates. And then again, staff response. So staff response is not always going to be what you expect because their role may be really different than yours. And so I'll encourage you throughout the day in going into prisons to really work on those relationships and try to understand what the jobs are. So the job of an officer is to maintain the safety and security. It is not to understand advocacy. And so as much as they may not acknowledge or respect or understand your job right now, they probably feel the same way from you. So developing that relationship and saying, you know, this is really our role and them feeling like they have the ability to say the same uh, to you. That, hey, my, my job is really to make sure that inmates move during this five-minute period and that they do that in an orderly way. And when you talk to that inmate in the middle of that movement period and then disregard what I'm saying to you, it really lessens my credibility with the inmates, which is a big deal when we have 900 to 3,000 inmates in one facility. So really thinking about um, how we maintain order in a facility and then your role in that. So the social cultural perspective regarding PREA, I wanted to talk about this because I think it's incredibly important and I said earlier, but I, I want to keep reiterating this, that it doesn't matter what we believe. A lot of these things are social norms, and you're going to see them. And I, I, again, challenge you, when you see an article about the Department of Corrections, when you see an article about prison rape, read the comments, because the inmates are reading the comments. And the comments are atrocious. This is the one place that you're going to see. We had a female officer arrested three years ago for a Prison Rape Elimination Act, for a relationship, a sexual relationship with a male inmate. And in one of the articles, they dressed her up in kind of S&M gear and said, what a sexy cop. 
and he wanted it, and how lucky was he to get laid by this woman, and so these really negative, pervasively negative comments that we wouldn't see in other areas, that people aren't ashamed to say, like, inmates deserve it. Look what they did. Of course they deserve to be raised. And so while that's not something that I believe or you believe, that is something that society, some segment of society believes, and it's something that the inmates are regularly exposed to. So their ability to believe that you're there for their best interest immediately might be a little low. They might be really hard to deal with at first. They might not believe that you have their best interest or that you don't that you believe that they didn't deserve it. Um, so that might be a different start to a conversation than you would typically have. Um, so again, it, I don't think there's probably a single person on this phone line, and if there is, kudos to you for hanging out with really cool people who don't make inappropriate jokes. But most of us have heard soap on a rope jokes or dropping the soap jokes, and pretty inappropriate. If you apply that to other parts of society, we wouldn't accept it, not for a minute. And this is an area where that has just been accepted over the years. And so we're moving towards not accepting that and really challenging those beliefs and saying, this is not okay. We don't believe that this should exist. And again, what a wonderful moment to bring both parties together on an issue. Um, and clearly, human beings on both sides of government says this is important and we have to care about this. So there's a culture in men's facilities more specifically, and I'll, distinct, I'll distinguish between the two in these lessons because women's prisons and men's prisons are significantly different. But the culture of shame, of course, exists in both, both facilities. Um, but you're going to see more shame around not being tough in a men's facility. So this victimization that potentially occurred can end up in a really shameful experience for that inmate. Uh, there might be jokes from other inmates or about them, and then if, if your whole ideology about masculinity is this kind of level of, uh, it's determined by how tough and how much respect I have, and that all comes crashing down in one moment, then you're being impacted in more than just one way. So offenders, in their own minds, in so many ways, are defined by their own toughness. So, um, yeah, maybe that got taken away in that act of sexual violence as well. The, there's the societal rhetoric around offenders getting what they deserve. And so that's going to be something that you certainly will see in the comments section of most papers. And again, this is Washington State, so we would think that folks are a little more advanced and wouldn't say things like that. They certainly do. And every time we have a prosecution around PREA, we're going to see some of those comments. Um, always pretty shocking to me, but I stay in the know about what people are thinking because I think it helps inform my work and I think it definitely helps inform your work when you know what the people that you're dealing with maybe believe about themselves based on what society is saying about them. Well, none of the comments above and that I've made in this section are acceptable. That like they're saying this, it's not acceptable to me. It certainly should not be acceptable to you. It's important that we know they exist. It's important that you know the other side of any issue, I think, that if you're going to fight a battle, you should really know what the folks on the other side are saying. Um, so we need to know that there is a segment of society that feels that way about uh, the inmates so that we can properly work with them and go in ready to have constructive conversation with them. So in talking about the PREA standards, we'll talk pretty um, specifically about some of the standards, but then a little more broadly about others. So there are approximately 190 standards, many of which have subsections, some of them A through D, some A through C. I didn't want to go through and count them all. I didn't think that probably was very important to you all. But just know there are a lot of them, and they apply to every piece of the work that is done in a prison. So everything from how do we do maintenance on the facility? So how do I change out a soap dispenser might be affected by a PREA standard. Also how I do intake on LGBTIQ offenders, I'm going to take into consideration a standard there. I'm also going to, if I'm dealing with somebody that's low functioning, there is a standard for that. Um, so again, they apply to HR. 
there's not a person that works in a prison that isn't well versed at this point in PREA standards that doesn't understand how PREA standards apply to their specific role. So some of the standards that have, that were published in 2012 and are now being implemented and audited nationwide are, we'll talk about them. And so the first was mandating policy language that says agencies will take a zero tolerance approach towards all forms of sexual abuse and harassment. And Washington State has gone a step further and really will look into those things that might not meet the criteria for sexual violence. So we not only would look into sex, consensual or not, oral sex, consensual or not, but we would look into things like hugging and kissing and writing a letter, anything that indicates over familiarity or grooming patterns for a relationship or things that Washington State Department of Corrections would look into that aren't necessarily under PREA. So just so you all know, we are pretty thorough in our approach because we take this that seriously. We have mandates having to do with screening tools that are used on incoming offenders. We do this in order to ensure that potential victims are not housed with potential predators. And so at intake, there are questions that are asked because it's called the PREA risk assessment. Important probably for you to know that terminology and talking to classification staff would be the ones that would use that tool. And some of the questions are, you know, age, youthful or somebody who's older, does that increase vulnerability? Certainly it does. For men, their weight being, them being really small in stature, them being shorter, again, combine that with being young and you have a potential victim on your hands. Somebody who has the potential for predation, we're really looking for folks who maybe have a history of sexual violence in custody, maybe have had a lot of sexual violence in the community, that might be what they're incarcerated for, although we know that that's not necessarily a predictor of acting out in custody. So we would look at some of those things kind of independently. Mandates that youthful offenders are kept separate from adult offenders. And this is one of those that's pretty complicated. So we do have youth facilities in the state, although the youthful offenders are processed through the reception centers, which would be the Washington Correction Center for Women and Washington Correction Center in Shelton. And so when they're processed in, they would have to be kept separate and they are kept separate from the adult offenders. I'm sure you can figure out why we do that. There was a time in this state nationwide that youthful offenders were housed in adult prisons. And there are places in the United States that continue to use that practice. Certainly not a practice for the reason that I just said, that youth is a predictor of sexual potential victimization. So we make sure that they're processed quickly, that they're kept away from the adult offenders. And that mandate also includes language that says that we have to make sure that they're still programming and have access to the things that an adult offender would have. So whether that's a law library or other programming, they should have that access. So it's complicated. Some of this, it looks like one tiny little sentence and you're like, yeah, that's nine words, but there's policy around it. And maybe there are three policies that drive your one tiny little sentence. So think about that on 190 standards, how long it takes to implement this in a prison. And to know that that prison may have had kind of the same thoughts about how to run a prison for a really long time. So there's also mandates around, we prohibit cross-gender strip search. So that had been a practice that was used. Cross-gender strip search used to be something that, well, Washington State probably has not done that in 20 years. There are states that did do it. And you can imagine why we would encourage no cross-gender strip search. That certainly is not trauma-informed, which is something we care greatly about as an agency. Prohibits cross-gender pass search on female offenders, discourages cross-gender pass search on male offenders, but 
Um, at this point, we are prohibiting cross-gender pad search on female offenders. It's except in an emergent situation, but honestly, there has not been an emergent situation that occurred. And what you'll know about Washington State is that the female facilities have uh, bona fide unqualification female posts. So both female facilities in Washington State have about 75% VFOQ positions. So there shouldn't be a time that there was an emergency significantly significant enough that 75% of your staff can't respond and pass search. So um, we probably shouldn't even talk about that because it probably would never happen. So is it something that could happen if there was an emergency, somebody was escaping? Yeah, but I don't know why we would pass search them if they're escaping. That wouldn't be at the top of our radar. There are also mandates that offenders coming into facilities receive a verbal and and then written information about PREA. So we want to make sure that they really understand what PREA is, how it impacts them, the piece about not having the ability to consent, which most of them do not like, um, because think about as an adult somebody saying to you, well, you don't have the ability to consent to sex. They don't necessarily agree with that, but that's a bigger conversation that we certainly don't have time for. Um, but we want to make sure that at orientations, so at both reception centers, they're getting a PREA orientation, which includes a video, which is very um, specific information around what PREA looks like, uh, where to go for help, that we have the two anonymous hotlines, one that goes to advocacy services and one that's internal for reporting of PREA incidents, um, that they have other methods of reporting that are confidential. So inside a prison, I can write an emergency grievance. I can communicate via a kite, which is a written form of communication, um, which can be anonymous. I can write an anonymous kite so that I don't have to fear retaliation. I can call the PREA hotline, which can be anonymous. Um, and then I can call the OCVA hotline as well and talk to an advocate and get connected to one of you uh, who would provide me different services than obviously the Department of Corrections would. Um, so, and then they'll get a brochure. And so there are brochures for low functioning offenders so that if they didn't necessarily understand uh, the brochure that we give to everyone, they would have that information as well as brochures in different languages, Spanish being the most predominant, but we are have translated brochures using our language line for multiple languages. So there are mandates that during intake process that our LGBTI population, um, that we talk to them and that consideration be taken specifically with transgendered offenders about where the offender feels safest being housed. And so that would be a longer conversation that would have happen with your senior staff in a prison around where do you feel safest? What do you think the best housing placement would be for you? Um, and then that information is reviewed um, at a pretty high level in the agency to ensure that we are housing people in the safest way possible for them. And um, in women's prisons, maybe that is worries about predation, um, but we, we look at the issues all the way around. So is your is your sexuality um, putting you at risk for victimization or predation? Um, so we would we would have longer conversations around that and then take into consideration where the offender feels safest. Um, we have mandates that PREA information is available in multiple languages um, and again for low functioning offenders. Mandates that advocates be available to offenders and that there's a confidential reporting system, and clearly we're working on that, or you wouldn't be on this call. Uh, mandates about the reporting and tracking of all PREA investigations. So every allegation that comes in is tracked so that we can maintain, and then once a year or more often, sometimes there is some study of that data to see are there trends in this data or are there things that we should be watching for and at the end of every free investigation we're going to go over the report and really talk about um, were there supplemental uh, or systemic issues that occurred during that kind of enabled the sexual violence to occur so could 
there be more cameras? Are the cameras visible? Are offenders aware that cameras exist? Uh, could there have been more information? Could somebody have been caught earlier in a system of manipulation or compromise? What are those things that we can do? So when we're talking about systemic issues, usually we're talking about um, the things, processes, and process improvements, and then our supplemental things are things that staff could have done better. So maybe reporting earlier or giving a warning or whatever that looks like, failure to report or failure to cooperate with an investigation, uh, we would note that and go over that after completing every PREA investigation so that we can say, hey, this bathroom has had 10 sexual assaults occur in the last four years. Maybe we should be looking at that bathroom. Obviously, we should be looking at that bathroom and saying, can we put a three-way mirror in? Can we put a, well, we can't put a camera in the bathroom, but what can we do to ensure that this doesn't occur at this rate. Um, and then specific standards to ensure that offenders get proper medical and mental health services. Um, and so there are probably 40 standards that apply just to medical and mental health, but quality of care, obviously very important in prisons. Um, that is one of the first things that causes prison violence not sexual violence, just riots, that kind of thing, are food, crappy food, and crappy medical will take your prison in a second. And so this really has helped our staff to deliver really quality medical care. Um, our, uh, the Washington State Offender Health Plan is state-of-the-art and is kind of held on high in front of the other states So we really are looked up to for the Offender Health Plan. So really knowing that these standards apply to this many areas, I think it's really important for you all to understand uh, how seriously we've taken this, that we've really put our money where our mouth is, um, for lack of a better analogy there. So PREA fundamentally changed the way prisons operate. And what we know, and what I often say in teaching prison staff is if I could be sexually assaulted in an area, I could also be stabbed in that area. I could also be violently attacked in that area. So this has increased our safety. It increases the, the, uh, the quality of the work that we do. If you know that your investigation is going to be seen by multiple parties and then tracked for data, you might do a better job on that. It has increased partnership. So just this partnership with WICSAP and being this out of the box, uh, this certainly isn't something that's been done anywhere else. Um, and it's pretty state of the art. We're really excited about the partnership, but it opens your eyes to the way other folks see the work that you do um, and then makes you able to do your work better. So we're bringing in subject matter experts um, around advocacy who then help inform the work that we do. So that, again, that's that encouragement of the conversations that I said, hey, you're in a prison, have a talk with an officer about why they think it's so important for you not to walk outside the yellow line rather than just challenging it. And then hopefully they'll have the same conversations with you because as you may know, advocates aren't always perceived in the way that you see yourself. So being able to have those conversations and, and present, you know, this is what I actually do, not what society thinks I do. Um, and then yeah, so it changed our culture. It's having the conversations. It's acknowledging that prison rape even exists. So prior to 2003, we all just kind of operated in a way that said, well, we know this happens. Maybe there's a trend here. We don't really know. There's no proper tracking mechanism for that. And we're busy keeping people alive and ensuring that they don't escape because, after all, and our mission is to increase public safety. And we clearly see that we increase public safety by ensuring that folks aren't subjected to sexual violence while incarcerated. And so it really does. It ties right into the mission statement of the Department of Corrections and then to jails and prisons in general. So PREA, of course, brought really good attention to an important issue. This is something that we know is important and we're spending a lot of time talking about it. And again, has changed our work in such a fundamentally positive way that we are having these conversations with folks. And 
let's say they weren't sexually victimized during this incarceration. Would we talk about it? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe somebody is getting good counseling. They've come back to prison, and now they can get that mental health treatment that they needed in order to deal with post-traumatic stress. Will that increase their odds of staying out next time? Absolutely. So doing good work in that way, too. And then prayer really aims to ensure that offenders are able to serve their time without sexual violence. I mean, at the end of the day, this is what it's about, right, that we are building a facility where we don't have line of sight issues, where I can't go hide behind a food cart with an offender and have sex. Um, again, there's no consent, so whether they want to or not, I can't do that. Um, and we are going to make sure in every way that we can that we are creating prisons that are a place that you cannot act out sexually with other folks in a violent way, well, in any way. Um, so that, in total, is the information that I thought was really important that you have about Korea. Of course, in the months coming, you may have questions. You should reach out to your site supervisor or to WICSAP um, for clarification about anything that you've heard in this lesson. But hopefully, you understand a little bit more about Korea and why it's important both to prisons and to advocates. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.